Welcome to the Raisina Ideas Pod. My name is Navdeep Suri. I'm a distinguished fellow at ORF, and it's my pleasure to be in conversation today with Her Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Slovenia, uh, Madam Tania Fayun. Madam, welcome to the Ideas Pod. Um, I was delighted to learn that you are, uh, your country is going to be a candidate for the UN Security Council, uh, and that gives me a very good starting point um, that you are seeking candidature at a time when uh, there's a broad feeling in the developing world that the multilateral system is kind of broken. Um, we've just completed an anniversary of uh, the war in Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, without any conflict in uh, any ending in sight. Mm -hmm. um, the UN Security Council itself seems to be helpless, uh, wringing hands, uh, unable to do anything of substance because of the veto power of uh, a protagonist. Um, how do you feel that the system can be reformed? And what would your ideas be for uh, the reform of the multilateral system? Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be your guest and, of course, uh, a participant also in a Razina Dialogue, which is an excellent platform to exchange the ideas, thoughts, what is going on in uh, this today's very complex and a very fragmented uh, world. Uh, certainly after the 24th of February last year, uh, the world has changed. And we see um, that we have a lot of challenges, not only because of the brutal Russian aggression war in Ukraine, but we have many conflict areas and uh, challenges around the globe, um, naming climate change, energy, poverty, security, um, food security. Um, so we have to work together. We have to have a complete picture and we have to work on the basis of rules, basis of solidarity. That is why I'm strongly committed and Slovenia being a small country, we really understand what does it mean to respect the UN Charter, the international law, and the human rights. Why am I saying that? Um, because today we have a huge task ahead, you are right. We have a Security Council that is really uh, very much um, jeopardized, blocked if you say so. We have um, some countries or some national interests that go beyond the rules, and that is causing the distress in geoeconomics, geopolitics of today. So Slovenia, um, I see our country as someone that traditionally was always very good in promoting fundamental rights, democracy, and international law, because um, it, for us, stability, peace, and dialogue is extremely important. And that is what we want to bring on the table in the UN Security Council, to be an honest broker, to be engaged in a dialogue with every single country, be it a small or be it a big, and understand what are the needs that we will make the system efficient again. Yes, can be a reform, but I think before that, we have also to address other topics. I think the world is so interconnected today that it's important that we listen to each other, that we hear each other, and truly understand what are our needs to find broader consensuses and a way forward. We have to work together. Your Excellency, even before the 24th of February last year, there was a feeling that there were conflicts in different parts of the globe that were erupting. You had Nagorno-Karabakh, you had the situation mm -hmm. in Ethiopia and the Tigray. Um, you've had the whole disaster, the fiasco in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. and, and there was this sense that we are in the first quarter of the 22nd century coming to an end to 2023. We stuck with a 1945 architecture. And the word has obviously changed a lot in the last uh, 75, 80 years. And yet we're trying to address today's problems with day before yesterday's mm -hmm. uh, architecture. Country like India, which no matter which way you look at it, um, now the largest country in terms of population, one sixth of mankind, 
the fifth largest economy, one of the largest contributors to peacekeeping forces, etc., doesn't find a place on the high table uh, in, in the UN. So how does a body that is unrepresentative, that doesn't have any country from Africa, any country from Latin America, has the victors of 1945, how does it claim the legitimacy to actually address these issues? But you see, if you look throughout the history, we always had conflicts, we always had wars, violation of human rights, migration, people living in distress, violence. And for that is important that we do respect certain rules that are enshrined in the UN Charter or international law. But uh, next to it, yes, we can agree that we fail in many ways when we see what's happening today in Palestine or in Afghanistan or conflicts around, um, name it, it's, you, you said it yourself. One thing to add, it's of course responsible leadership. What does it mean responsible leadership? We have to be very clear who is the one that is aggressor, who is the one that is victim, to say it clearly. And I do understand that now in Europe, where we try really to keep our unity because it's our region, um, and the war is not far away, so it's a question of insecurity. But we should at the same time be able to see what is happening around the world. For example, I hear often the West against the rest. That is wrong. And we should embrace each other. We should embrace global south. Um, because if you have in today globalized world climate change that affects half of population, we need big powers like China, like US, like Europe to work together to fight climate change because we are together the biggest consumers of energy and the bigger producers of greenhouse emissions. And goes the same. So we have to find synergies where we have to find common solutions because our goal, and this is responsible behavior, is to make our societies stable, prosperous, and going forward. That I also often say, you have to focus on one hand on technology, on innovation, artificial intelligence, what is future, and people and young generation. So when we are searching answers how to protect international law, how to protect our societies, make them more resilient, we need to engage all parts of our society, be it scientists, researchers, academia, civil society, business, big corporations, and politics. I think today the world is so complex that we need each other. And India, for example, it's an important strategic partner, not to Europe only, but to many other parts of the world. Now on the head of G20, with sustainable goals development, with climate change, with wars, with insecurity, will play a very, very important role to put all these pieces that are there in some stable peace at the world. Minister, what you said is totally uh, true. Uh, there is no lack of aspiration, there is no lack of ideas, and there's no lack of challenges. I think if there's a lack, it's of political will, mm -hmm. and it's of execution or implementation. Um, many years ago, promises were made uh, to the developing world that the developed countries would spend 0.7% of their GDP for development assistance. Many years ago, promises were made of a $100 billion uh, fund to uh, assist developing countries in making the green transition, in addressing the challenges of climate change. When serious agreements are not honored, by developed countries, mm -hmm. who uh, can persuade them? How do you build the political will in societies that, hey, this is important in our own long-term enlightened self-interest, that we do these right things that we've committed to? But then let's make it clear. If you know that in certain war there is an aggressor, how can you do business with it? That is hypocrisy. 
So this is about also responsible leadership. You know, if you see that someone does wrong, it's taking by force someone's land away, then you have to react. And here, of course, are challenges because you see that the business has different advantages and goes not really in line what politics and the rules are created for. And that is, um, I think, we have to work hand in hand. Slovenia, you see, is a, is a small country of two million inhabitants. Uh, we went through bloody wars 20, 30 years ago with the former Yugoslavia. We know what is at stake to, to have people suffering. But we are, at the same time, a soft power. We want to invest in a science, in a research, for us, peace and dialogue, it's important, it's part of constitution. But not only we want to, to invest in development, in humanitarian aid, in material aid, to support other less developed parts of the world according to our capacity. Because this is what we believe in, not in a force, but in a dialogue and peace. I guess the, um, I mean, this is the point I wanted to uh, come to in terms of the reform of the multilateral system is that we're dealing with institutions and not just the United Nations. Um, there's the IMF, there's the World Bank, there's the WTO, there is uh, the WHO and, and, and a whole host of others um, which are crying for reform. Uh, and we see that each crisis exposes the weakness of the prevailing system. So I guess the challenge before um, us as uh, members of the international community uh, is to rally enough support mm -hmm. to try and fix it. This morning, I was moderating a session on BRICS mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in the Raisina Dialogues. And uh, um, you know, the idea behind BRICS was that because the, um, the Western world has not lived up to its obligations, mm -hmm. maybe you need an alternate voice which represents the global south. Uh, and, and I think you will see these uh, demands get more and more shrill uh, if action isn't seen as taken, being taken. You know, you're living in a system where the president of the World Bank is appointed by the United States, the president of the IMF is appointed by Europe. Hey, the word's changed. Somebody hasn't noticed it, maybe. <laughs> no, but you are very much right. And I will just reflect and let you think how I see it from the perspective of Europe. We are, you know, European Union has been created for decades on the ruins of war and poverty. So the big powers gather together to establish peace, security, democracy, rule of law. Now, last years, we are going from one crisis to another crisis, from economy crisis, um, COVID, um, refugee crisis, migration crisis, name it. Each next crisis comes at an earlier stage before we are capable to resolve the previous one. And now we are in a, in a way at a crossroad, how to move forward, a reform. How to, but I strongly believe then we have to go back at the core to understand what was the strategic importance of our alliance or of our institution, of our rule-based system to preserve peace and stability. And we have to go back and ask maybe each and one single partner of the alliance, what is important for you? And find a common nominator. What is the glue between us? And start maybe from the scratch, but be aware what is at stake. And this goes regional wise, maybe even more, and then global wise and through all the institutions we have. To go maybe back at the scratch, why we created ourselves, what was the reason for that to understand and have a complete picture? This is the process we are going through on European continent. And the challenges are uh, there. They are visible, uh, particularly at this point of time. And certainly there's a hope that, you know, the, the commitment to, to rule of law, um, um, to the international rules of the game applies as much to other countries. You started by talking about Palestine, and I think uh, and that's as much legitimately an issue for the international community as, 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 as Ukraine uh, is at this point of time. But um, Your Excellency, best wishes for Slovenia's uh, candidature uh, for the UN Security Council, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.